During September, we max out the Chariot Social Link, experience the only rainy day of the entire year, and take on Block 4 of Tartarus on the last day of September. The next Guardians are the Arcane Turrets, and these guys pretty much follow the same strategy as the previous Guardians with weaknesses, so we just exploit their weakness to ice with Makoto since we toss Mitsuru in the trash, and thankfully with everyone having a turn after every enemy, we can assign all three to attack one turret at a time, while Makoto uses the knockdown exploit to skip their turn. Thankfully, we managed to get through the entire fight without taking damage and with the only HP loss being the use of physical skills. We level up to 28, and all seems well, until... Oh yes, everyone's favorite difficulty spike who was snoring on his way up and is a block too low the sleeping table. And here we are at level 28 and far low tier skills than usual. The sleeping table can attack with heavy fire and heavy almighty, both of which can do severe damage, making this run on normal and hard difficulty definitely impossible without missing out on the old document. Its other moves are a light insta-kill attack and evil touch to inflict a party with fear. But if it uses Ghastly Whale on anyone inflicted with fear, it's a 100% guaranteed insta-kill. So not only is this boss fight a roadblock demanding for higher endurance and a need to grind, but it's also heavily reliant on insta-kill chance. Sadly, there's no way we can null or decrease our chances of being inflicted with fear due to our low level. However, luckily for us, at level 28, there are two Personas who nullify fire, protecting Makoto from Maragidine. Those Personas being Orthrus of the Hainman and Sati of the Magician. And luckily for us, we max out both the Hainman and Magician, so one or both of these Personas is our best shot against the Sleeping Table. Now, one thing you'll notice on the first attempt is how heavy the damage is. So having the skill Taruna is a definite must if you want at least one party member to survive two turns without getting KO'd. Ken will do the most amount of damage with Zionga, as Sleep and Table resists both Slash and Pierce attacks. However, for as ill-advised as it may seem, I seem to find that the best way to arrange the tactics is to have Koro and Igus on Full Assault, and Ken on healing duty. Ken's Diorama is enough to fully recover our HP, and if there's no one to heal, he will go for Zionga. So leave it Ken on healing and support is the best strategy, while Igus and Koro slowly chip away at the sleeping table's health. Thankfully, Maragi Dine can only harm Igus and Ken as Makoto and Koro will nullify fire damage, but don't be surprised if you end up healing or reviving your allies a lot with Makoto because they will go down if healing isn't kept up and the attack debuff reverts itself. So the strategy here is to debuff the attack, keep everyone alive, and have Igus and Koro slowly chip away at the health. We were doing so fine until Makoto got inflicted with fear, and sometimes you will have a chance to use your turn, but if not, you already lost the battle as the fight ends with a bullshit insta-kill. So not only is Sleep and Table a test of endurance, but also a test of luck and patience, which is why this boss is so infamous. The second attempt, I went in with the same strategy. Ken on Healin, I guess in Korra on Fall Assault, and for Makoto, I mainly use Sati as she has a better luck stat and better skills than Orthrus does. So this time, I used Taruna first turn, and let me just say, it was hard keeping my allies alive, while also trying to keep the enemy's attack debuffed. Sadly, the second attempt ended with a Megidola despite having the table's attack debuffed. On the third attempt, I decided to go with the strategy of using Magic Mirrors. While it is pointless repelling Evil Touch and Light Back, it saves us the possibility of being insta-killed while also wasting its turn. And if it uses Meraki Dine at the right time, we can repel a small bit of damage on the table. Thankfully, I got 8 Magic Mirrors to work with thanks to the Golden Chess, and this really helped keep my party alive to conserve my Balms of Life. And since the table can only attack us with Megidola, this gives Ken more turns to use the Yonga over healing. But still, you want to make sure you keep the boss's attack and defense debuffed if you really want to make progress. Throughout the fight, I used 3 Magic Mirrors, 1 Potra Jam to cure the fear, and all 4 of my bead chains. 
Thankfully, I did not have a single ally get KO during the third attempt as I switched to a persona with Zionga and finished the sleeping table, leveling Makoto to 29 and gaining my only accessory from leveling up a persona. Wow, that was definitely the toughest boss fight by far, and it really comes to show you how reliable your items, tactics, and social links are. So with the first half of Block 4 completed, make sure you do some grinding without grinding before you celebrate the 4th of October, as Tartarus is the only place you can gain better equipment for Aegis and Koromaru. Anyway, the 4th of October happens, and we have two new shadows to face. Except we have to do it without Ken, because of course. Oh, and one other guy is missing, but who cares about him? So obviously I add Koro and Igus to the team, and as for the fourth party member, since the game forces us to have a full party, I go with Akihiko simply for his Tarunda ability. So this fight has us fight in the Fortune and Strength Shadow, except we can only attack the Strength Shadow as the Fortune can only be targeted after the Strength's defeat. So I put Akihiko on healing and support to debuff the attack, while Korra and Igus go for whatever move they feel like. Now, the gimmick with this Full Moon boss is that the Fortune will spin a wheel and cause different buffs, debuffs, ailments, or even increase or decrease HP. Blue means it works in our favor, while red works in the enemy's favor. Now, there is always a way to land on the spot that you want. It took me a while to figure out the spot, but you pretty much want to press the button when the spot you want is on the 12 o'clock mark. Using this trick, we can always get the wheel to work in our favor. Now, the strength mostly attacks with physical attacks or inflicts charm or distress. Anytime ailments happen, we can simply use a Pacha Gem or Mi Pacha Gem to cure the ailments. As for damage, we just gotta match what we can. It is definitely a viable method just to use attack mirrors to repel the physical damage, and yeah, I did use them twice. At some point very early in the fight, Akihiko goes down, but I chose not to revive him for the entire fight so that way the party I plan to use gains the EXP. After the strength goes down, we now have the Fortune Shadow who goes between the Wheel of Fortune or using physical or wind attacks. For this phase, I use Kusi Mitama who nulls wind attacks, and it's just a matter of getting what I want from the wheel by pressing what I want when it's at the 12 o'clock mark. Now, there is actually a really good trick to make use of the knockdown tactic since we can do all our attacks here, unlike with the Strength Shadow. By inflicting the fortune with Distress, we have a high chance of causing critical damage. Seeing as Koro goes last before the Fortune's turn, we switch his tactics to Knockdown, so if Makoto or Aikis gets a critical, we use an all-out attack. If Koro gets a critical, we skip the all attack, allowing the Fortune to skip its turn. This trick will only last as long as the ailment is on him, and if Koro lands a critical, which thankfully he did every time. So with good use of the wheel, the distress and knockdown strategy, we managed to beat this full moon boss fight on the first try while Akihiko uses napping as a part of his strategy. Hey everybody, so before we end this day with a bane, be sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe, and ding the bell for more Nits the Gamer content. I hope you're all enjoying the video, and now, let's get into spoiler sections. So, it turns out Shinjiro is responsible for the death of Ken's mother due to him losing control of his power two years ago, and now, Ken wants to avenge his mother. But, Takaya from Striga offers to do the same, and to kill Ken as well. But... Yeah, this moment is where the game starts to become less about depression and sadness and more about death which will become the game's main theme for the rest of the run. Shinjiro dies and, well, the later scenes sure set the mood. <sighs> will this speech ever end? Say something, will ya? Why are you always like that? 
It didn't matter how tough I was. Look what happened. Oh, for fuck's sakes. I guess, honey, could you be a darling and smack the person who thought Changing Seasons was a great song to play on this day? Seriously, this is the worst goddamn song in this game. I don't care if it's an unpopular opinion. I hate Changing Seasons. So the next day, Ken awakens to his ultimate persona, allowing him to nullify light, and we max out the moon and tower social links, with both nighttime social links maxed and my social stats maxed. Most of my nighttime is spent on raising my persona's strength, magic, and agility at the arcade for a better chance of winning the next Guardian fights. Oh, and speaking of the next Guardian, we have no chance of winning against the Hell Knights. No, I'm sadly not kidding. This fight is going to be very hard for me to put into words, but let's just say, be it severely underleveled, it started to take its toll here. Sleepy Table was exploitable with the use of magic mirrors, but with the Hell Knights? I'll do my best to explain. They can attack with Pierce, Heat Wave, Zeodyne, and Mazeodyne, and can mind charge because why not? Oh, and if you're trying to come in with a Null Elect Persona, they could use Elect Break on you because Atlas hates fun. The Knights resist all elemental attacks, drains electric, and while they're neutral to physical, we're barely doing that much damage to them. Now, the usual cheese for this fight in a casual playthrough is to use Succubus and Incubus in a fusion spell to charm all the Knights to attack each other. Sadly, we're under level to fuse either Personas. Trying to brute force our way through while keeping everyone healed is not a good strategy as Igus can get knocked down with electric. We take over 100 points of damage and we're given no room to make that much progress on targeting just one enemy. Next, I fused a persona that can resist electric and has skills such as Evil Smile and Fear Boost, along with Mary Karen and Charm Boost. However, trying to inflict the knights with fear does absolutely nothing. While they don't nullify it, or at least they say they don't nullify it, the fear ailment never connects despite having fear boost. Now, Marin Karen does have a chance to connect, but just like the case with Mitsuru, it barely connects. And there's no guarantee that the knight will attack its allies, which was the whole point of inflicting them with charm to begin with, so ailments is not a workable strategy. I then said, screw it, and use attack mirrors in the hopes of repelling physical damage. But here's the thing. The enemy seem to know when Tetrakarn and Makarakarn is active. So when the attack mirrors are up, it's rare that they will ever go for a physical attack. And by using both an attack mirror and a magic mirror, it really makes no difference. And the downside with using a magic mirror is that repelling electric will only gain them some health. And with Makoto being the only character who can use items, there's no way we can use magic mirrors and a leg break in one turn unless we add direct commands on our party members, which sadly is not in this version of this game. While it is possible to use electricity for repel damage, the setup is highly reliant on luck. Sadly, there's just no good strategy to get through this fight. I've tried so many different strategies. Even tried using the distress on the knights and nothing. Yeah, if you thought Sleep and Table was the difficulty spike of the run, the Hell Knights are the true difficulty spikes of the run. And unfortunately, I ran out of ideas. So we have three options. Option one, we can try and try again for hours till something works. Option two, we use up cards to up our persona stats as I've been saving those up for the end game. Or three, we miss the deadline for the seventh document as we're only going to miss out on one Sama and hope that we can beat the Hangman Shadow without beating any of the Guardians on the second half of Block 4. Obviously, the logical answer is to put the Shadow population on the Endangered Species list and grind up some levels, but that goes against the morals of this challenge run. So, as a challenge runner, I went with option 1. First, I do some grinding without grinding to get better equipment. Second, upon further research, other than using Charm, we can also use Poison on the Knights. And unlike Charm, 
poison never goes away, and the Hell Knights can't cure poison. So by fusing Gur of the Moon, we can get Poison Mist and Poison Boost, and later refuse those skills within to Mothman who resists Electric. And the strategy is impossible for me to explain. Why? Because after so much trial and error, I have finally beaten them. A 23 minute battle where my tactics and strategy kept constantly changing and I had to adapt to every situation. So much so that I'll link the video in the description down below because I can't describe what happens in this fight. The short summary is that we use Poison Mist to try to get as many knights poisoned and have Igis and Koro set on assigned target to the enemy who is poisoned, so we take them down one by one, and even by the last night, it still proved one of the most brutal fights I have ever done in a video game ever. I've used so much magic mirrors, one attack mirror, bead chains, beads, precious egg, and alternating between different personas to manipulate the AI's behavior. It's... It's truly impossible to put this fight into words. You would just have to see it for yourself as a whole. Even when I repelled the damage back at the enemy at one point, which fully restored its HP, I refused to reset because this is as far as I've come and I wanted to push further till it was over. But the short answer is, yes, it is possible to beat the Hell Knights before the deadline without grinding, so, we did not have to resort to options 2 or 3, thank god. And mind you, this is on easy difficulty. So if this run was done on normal or hard, it would be straight up impossible. But yes, I got it done and over with. There is a video available for you to see to see how I won this fight. And with that, let's move on because my brain hurts from just talking about these Hell Knights. Next, we got the Mythical Gigas. Don't let the plural fool you, it's only just one. He repels Strike, Nulls Pierce, Drains Fire, and is resistant to Slash. And while we can still cause damage with Slash, it has High Counter, which is a 50% chance of repelling physical damage. Because of these affinities, Igis and Koromaru are useless as attackers, so you're better off putting them on heal and support, though mind you, they're doing 100% supporting and no healing. And Ken is set on full assault since Zioga is neutral. The mythical Gigas can attack with all three physical attacks and fire, so Eligor is a good persona to use for this fight. Unfortunately, I did not fuse Eligor with any offensive skills outside of physical, and I did not have him with Tarunda or Rakukaja. Sadly, despite his attack being debuffed, a power charge heavy slash attack is enough to surpass Makoto's maximum health. So obviously, we need more endurance, or at least a persona with Rakukaja. Sadly, we have the best and most endurable persona we got at level 32. One who I took on arcade trips, mind you. We're still too under level to fuse a persona with Ma Rakukasha to buff everyone's defense, and I'm using the best defense armor available from Block 4 with a plus 3 endurance buff. On top of that, there's also a chance that the mythical Giga will use Ma Rakunda on us, which doesn't help at all. So if we want to get past this fight, we have to endure as much damage as possible. So right now, it's just a matter of trial and error. If we can get past the Hellish Knight somehow, god damn it, I'm gonna make the Mythical Gigas possible somehow. On the second attempt, I altered between two different personas, Eligor with the best defense and to nullify fire, to debuff the agility and buff Ken's attack, and the next best persona with over 30 endurance that had Tarunda was Loa. So, the only reason I ever equipped Loa was to use Tarunda that turn, otherwise I always have Eligor equipped. This attempt actually went pretty well, as the only major damage was Deathbound. Sadly, I lost the second attempt due to an unlucky critical. So for the third attempt, I equipped an accessory to give Makoto high counter, which again has a 50% chance of repelling physical damage, so this should increase our chances of not getting crit while doing damage ourselves. During the third attempt, I did use up my last two attack mirrors I had on me, which all did not go to waste and repelled Deathbound back at the Giga. And any time it went for Deathbound, High Counter always triggered. So with Eligor who nullifies fire, this fight was doable. 
We did get some KOs and had to use up some expensive items, but the fight was possible with Koro only buffing agility, I guess buffing with all three buffs, and Ken being the only one doing like 98% of the damage. While Makoto swaps between Loa for Tarunda and Eligor to debuff agility, buff Ken's attack, or use items when it was absolutely necessary. There were plenty of close calls, but with one last lightning damage from Makoto, we were finally able to finish the last Guardian of Block 4, leveling up to 33. As you might have noticed, these bosses are only going to get harder. So thinking of a strategy and fusing a persona ahead of time to take to the arcade is a definite must to make this run possible. The next and final full moon mission takes place on the bridge, but Strako blocks our path to the final shadow, and the fight against them is easy. The only concern you'll need is to analyze Jin first so that way Koromaru knows not to use fire attacks on him, and even though we are under leveled and doing mini school damage, this fight is pretty easy. You just take out Jin first, and then go after Takaya. They might take more than half of our HP away, but as long as Ken is on healing duty, this fight is a breeze. And this fight ends with Takaya using Mind Charge and killing Makoto with Megido. Well, I'll be damned. I'm probably the only person on this planet to ever lose to this fight on easy difficulty. The second try we were able to win and level up from 33 to 36. Takaya and Jin are so ashamed by their loss that Takaya tries to shoot himself, but Jin reminds him that that logic doesn't work in this game, so they jump off the bridge instead. Now, in order to win the fight against the Hainman, we have to bring down the three statues. The one on the left nulls fire and attacks with fire. The one in the middle nulls ice and attacks with ice. And the one on the right nulls electric and attacks with electric. Pretty easy to remember. Now, you want to keep the damage on them constant, as the Hainman can summon another enemy that nulls ice and attacks with slash. The strategy for this fight is to bring down the statues and attack the Hainman as much as possible before he summons the statues again, and the cycle resets. Now, we do a good amount of damage on the statues themselves. The Hainman, however, we're only doing like 50 damage for a boss that has 5,500 HP, so this is going to be a long fight. Unfortunately, the Hainman attacks with heavy and severe strike, and one Akasha Arts is enough to instantly kill Makoto. So for the third attempt, I use a persona that resists strike, but I run into an issue. This persona was not fused with a multi-attack and skill, and the best multi-attack and skill I got is Megido with Mothman, and since I took Mothman to the arcade to boost his magic, Mothman should be my best damage dealer. Sadly, if we down the Hainman before we're able to switch personas from Mothman to Cuckoo Lane, Makoto will get instantly killed with Akasha Arts, which is what happened during the third attempt. During the fourth attempt, I used a save state between fighting Strega and facing the Hainman. I pretty much never use save states up to this point of the game as the speed up button is on F4 and the load state button is on F3. Needless to say, I don't want to accidentally load a save state from way far back and have no way to recover my progress, so I just gotta remember to save state every once in a while. During the fourth attempt, I lost to Takaya exploring Eligor's weakness and finishing Makoto off with a Megido. Can I request two trophies please? The fifth attempt, I save stated just in case, and this time, I kept the persona that resists strike on me at all times so Makoto can at least live. And let me just say, holy crap was this a super long boss fight. What should only take like 10 minutes at most, actually took a whole hour to complete. I'm not joking. We do so little damage on the Hainman that the Hainman is constantly summoning the statues back. We go through so many turns taking down these minions. I kid you not, I had like 12 summons of these statues. Yeah, that's how little damage you give to the Hainman. We just have to hope that on some turns, he actually uses God's Hand or Akasha Arts or gives birth to one of his sperm minions, because these statues really drag out the fight. But thankfully, the statues are easy to deal with, and having a persona that resists strike helps a lot. I did have to revive Ken at least once, otherwise I mostly have Ken on healing, I guess on full assault, and Koru either on full assault or assigned target. 
And this fight did teach me a few things. Since the right statue who uses electric is the only one to exploit a weakness, I focus on taking the right statue out first, and if we want Koru to attack multiple enemies with fire, we have to get rid of the left statue, and also, if we want Igis to use Swift Strike to attack all enemies, we have to have her tactics set on full assault, as assigned target will only have her attack a singular enemy. So, you just gotta be very smart with what tactics you choose for Koro and Igis. Another thing to keep in mind is that the Hangman will be considered in a knockdown state when you take down the statues, so it can be used as a way to skip the Hangman's turn, or used as a way to do an all-out attack if his sperm babies are down or dead. An hour. This took a solid hour of nothing but fighting, staying alive, and me using up a lot of my gems and at least one Soma. It took so long, but with good tactics and a persona that resists strike, the Hayman is possible to beat at level 36, and we level up to level 39. Wow, if this is how hard the latest Full Moon Shadow is, imagine how hard the next one will be. Actually, what am I talking about? That was the last shadow we had to fight to put an end to the Dark Hour and Tartarus. So, we max out the death social link with Pharaohs, and we celebrate by eating textures on a table. Take a picture, and as midnight rolls around, we can all but confirm, yes, it is indeed possible to beat Persona 3 Fest with only mandatory battles. And now we went, what? So, it turns out the funniest character in the whole game tricked us into destroying all 12 shadows which will bring forth death and the fall of everything. We get crucified, and we see what happens when you bring a gunfight to a gunfight. Igis is ordered to kill us, but she is blown away by how hot Makoto is that she can't do it. The funniest character in the whole game tries to summon his persona by falling off a tall building, but sadly, it came at the cost of Mitsuru's father. One time my father made a promise. He swore that he would atone for endangering our generation, even if it cost him his life. But I... I wanted him to live. I... I became a Persona user to protect him. <laughs> Emotional. Heartbreaking. Speechless. You know what would be a great follow-up? Ah, uh, Atlas, known for their great stories and bad decisions. Now, the fortunate thing with being level 39 is that we can start fusing personas with support skills that debuff all enemies and buff all allies. Needless to say, we're seriously gonna need them for the upcoming Tartarus Guardians, so it's about time they were available. In the meantime, we max out the Sun social link and get introduced to a new student named Ryoji, who starts off as just some random douche trying to bane every girl in the school, but he does actually become very important to the story later on. Soon, we go on our field trip to Kyoto, and we get the Hot Springs event where Junpei screws up the timing for the Hot Springs, and we have to somehow evacuate the Hot Springs before the girls execute us. On my first playthrough, I got caught, so I never got to see the scenario where we succeed. So, with the power of save states, I made the effort to get past the Hot Spring event damageless. I failed two times, no thanks to Igus block in the upper right corner, and Mitsuru will be covering the upper left corner. You just gotta walk back and forth and try not to get caught by Yukari or Fuka. With enough time and patience, they get overheated and agree to go for some ice cream. And while Makoto and Akihiko survived, Junpei and Ryoji get burned to death. Oh well. There's no reward for surviving this event by the way, it's just a filler segment. I know what some of you are going to comment. It's not just a theater segment, it's character development! Sure, you do you. After that, we max out the lover's social link with Yukari, and Strega busts Chidori out of the hospital. On the 22nd of November, we're forced into a fight against Chidori, who is known to be the easiest boss fight in the whole game. And... Yeah, holy crap, she is easy, even when we're underleveled. I mainly use Black Frost for this fight, and the worst amount of damage she's done was a Mind Charge Augie Dine which did pitiful damage against Makoto. 
with some fault assault attacks, one Ma Rakunda, one critical, one all out attack, and three Kanan Eye fusion spells, Chidori goes down easily in four turns. And somehow, despite being the easiest boss in the entire game, she leveled us up from 39 to 42. It's weird how the harder bosses barely level us up, while the easier bosses level us up by at least three levels, but it's definitely worth it before we go to the next block. So, you know how the story goes. Takaya incorrectly performs a Persona 3 on Junpei, Chidori revives Junpei at the cost of her life, Junpei uses Augie on a guy who repels fire, and we finish the last story progressive fight till the final day we face the final boss fight. Now there's only 10 Tartarus Guardians left standing in our way. So at this point of the game, death is everywhere. Things are depressing. So, it makes sense that Block 5 of Tartarus turns itself into a disco party going, Oh yeah, death and depression fucking rocks, baby! Now, unlike Blocks 2 and 4, where they were divided into two sections, with each section being available per moon cycle, Block 5 is available all at once. Which means it's not only a longer block, but we have five Tartarus Guardians to fight. It's also the block where we have to hand in the final document before the second full moon late in December, as opposed to the next. Now, we want to get this block completed before the next full moon, as Igus will be unavailable all throughout December, and we need her for the rest of the game. So, let's see if we can get the last document by doing mandatory battles only. The first Guardian fight is against three Guardian Swords. They resist all physical attacks, along with fire and drain electricity. So, you want to attack with ice or wind attacks. They will attack with only slash and electric attacks, and can debuff our defense and buff their attack. Now for this fight, I initially went in with Gear Makala since he repels slash attacks. However, while it is possible for them to use slash, the Guardian Swords seem to favor electric attacks more. So I go in with Thoth who gnaws electric. Sadly, we lack the endurance to be able to survive all three of them. The first two attempts went the same. My party would die very fast, and while Makoto can survive electric attacks, dealing with all the enemies himself is not feasible, and if their attack is buffed, or if Makoto's defense is debuffed, one Tempest Slash is a guaranteed insta-kill. And sadly, the only persona that nulls electric and resists Slash is a weak persona, so we need to rely on the next best thing, Ma Rakukaja. Sadly, I did not fuse Thoth with Ma Rakukaja. But by going in attempt 3, the strategy was to have Ken on healing duty, I guess on full assault, and Koro on assigned target, while Makoto's job is to use Nandi to buff everyone's defense and swap to Thoth to nullify electric, while using Mediorama or Rakunda on whatever enemy I assigned Koro to attack. So while Igus is focused on attacking all enemies, Koro attacks one enemy with Ogidine, and Ken heals only one ally per turn, and Makoto's job is to keep our defense buffed while either healing or maintaining buffs and debuffs on enemies. And with the use of Ma Rakukaja, this fight became more than feasible. This fight took 25 minutes, but with careful use of tactics, Dakunda gems, healing, buffs and debuffs, we end the fight with an epic Kane and I move and move on. The second Guardian is three Stasis Giants, and their only moves are physical attacks, but they also come with power charge. They null slash, resist strike, pierce, fire, and win, so ice or electric is your best move. The best persona to use here is Gear Makala since he can repel slash attacks. Even if this does no damage, the Stasis Giants mostly attack with slash attacks, which should keep Makoto mostly safe. Now, the strategy here is very different from the last fight. The first attempt ended with a critical hit from a strike attack, so with a bit of luck boost, I go in with this strategy. I use Gear Makala to keep Makoto mostly safe while assigning Ken on healing duty, Igus on fall assault, and Koro on assigned target. I fused Gear Makala with my Rakuda, so this definitely helped get some damage in. But what really helped us was the skill Virus Breath. While it never poisons the giants, it does a lot of damage to them. Now, as I start lowering their health more, my party starts going down. I used a lot of Revival Beads to keep Ken up, as he has both the skills Diorama and Recarm. But with everyone, including Ken, constantly falling down, I had to fight these giants solo. 
Thankfully, with the giants mostly using slash attacks, I only had to use a few beads during this fight. Now the strategy was to throw Bufala and Zionga gems at one of them till defeat. Do the same to the second giant, and once I only had one giant left, I put everyone on healing and support and made sure that all my allies were standing again before I tossed more gems at the last giant. With one last pierce attack from Aegis, we managed to cheese our way through thanks to the asshole who wasted weeks of my life in the Persona 5 Royal doing nothing run. You achieve true redemption and forgiveness, Gear Makala. I apologize for calling you Rebellious Elephant throughout that entire video. Next, we have the Phantom Kane, who has insta-kill, light attacks, and Maggie Doe. Now, the unique property with his affinities is that our attacks do 75% of damage, except for slash attacks which do 125% damage. So for this fight, I put everyone on conserve SP so they don't use their magical attacks, and... Wow, this boss was a nice breath of fresh air because this has been the easiest boss fight other than Shidori for a long while. Just use a Persona that nulls light, lower the knight's defense, and attack. I pretty much never had to use Ken for healing, so this was an easy fight with only a few revival beads used due to light attacks sometimes working. Next, we got the Royal Dancers. They attack with Strike and Pierce and inflict Poison, Confuse, and Charm. But, little do they know, we have a trick up our sleeves. We just so happened to get level 43 from the last fight, which is just enough to fuse Succubus. With Succubus and Incubus in our party, we can do a fusion spell called Dreamfest, a skill that would have saved us from the hellish night fight, but thankfully can be used here too. When used, there's a high chance that all enemies will be inflicted with charm, forcing the dancers to attack each other or skip their turn. So I assigned Ken and Korra to attack one dancer while Igus is on full assault, and all I did with Makoto was buff our agility and debuff the dancer's defense. And if any dancer was not charmed, I used Dreamfest again. And the best part about this fight is that not only are the dancers attacking each other, but they're also wasting their turn using Charm D to get rid of the ailment. This made them stuck in a loop where I was able to get through the entire fight without taking damage. The only quote-unquote attack was Marin Karen from The Last Dancer, but it works just as well when Mitsuru uses it. So, thanks to a fusion spell and the power of lust, we pass our last possible Tartar's Guardian without taking damage. Then we got the Reckoning Dice. This boss nullifies every elemental attack, so we have to go in with physical attacks only. The dice mostly goes for Megidola, Megidolon, and Tetrakarn. Thankfully, this fight is actually very easy. If it uses Megidola or Megidolon, heal the party with whatever persona has Mediorama and the highest endurance. If it uses Tetrakarn, slash away with Gear Makala equipped so Makoto can get rid of the physical shield without taking damage himself. Put all of your party on full assault, can included, and only use Makoto to heal or get rid of the shield. I did have to use a Chew and Soul at least once due to our low HP, but otherwise, this fight was very easy, and we have not only completed all of Block 5 of Tartarus, but we also got the final document, proven that we can get all the old documents before their deadline in a mandatory battle only run. Would this be possible on normal difficulty? Well, considering the hell that I had to go through with the Hell Knights, I highly doubt it. But the more rewards we get from Elizabeth, the better. Also, around this time I was wrapping up, I didn't notice that Fuka's social link was reversed. This is my first time having the social link get reversed, no thanks to the jealousy mechanic when I was maxing out Yukari's social link. Seriously, who at Atlas thinks that every girl a guy bonds with wants to bang? This is just horrible game design. At least Mitsuru spam and Marikara can sometimes be useful. Well, I'll see if I can reverse it later. The next full moon happens, but we don't have to fight a boss this time. But instead, we get some clarity on what is really going on. It turns out that Ryoji is the appraiser of death and that humanity will come to extinction at the coming of Nyx. Also, I love this line delivery here when he responds to the possibility of stopping Nyx. I legit feel my heart sink in here. I'm sorry. Seriously, voice acting in some old games are seriously underappreciated. This is when the game starts to get really heavy as our death is inevitable. 
So Ryoji gives us an entire moon cycle to make a decision on whether or not we want to keep our memories and the knowledge that we're going to die, or have our memories be erased and we live peacefully without knowing we're going to die. As we spend the entirety of December making a decision, we bond with mostly the fortune or strength social link till the next block becomes available, though I use the majority of my time to raise my persona stats at the arcade, particularly Black Frost Magic and Kukulain's strength and agility since he has a heavy pierce skill, and pierce is a definite skill we need for the final Tartarus Guardian. I met in my bond with Fuka with one dialogue option and just decided to not bother with the female social links for the rest of the game. But the one thing I did do is make sure that Makoto doesn't die a virgin, because that would be a serious crime against the player. And with all the arcade trips, I max out Black Frost's magic stat. On December 30th, Igis finally comes back, and she's depressed because people keep telling her that AI art is not true art. We tell her that is not true, and she awakens to her ultimate persona, allowing her to nullify Pierce attacks. On New Year's Eve, we make our decision. If we kill Ryoji to erase our memories, we get the bad ending. Now, if this was a mandatory battle run for the bad ending, we wouldn't be doing Tartarus Guardians to begin with, so of course we let Ryoji live so we can go forth with the true ending. He reminds us that while Nyx cannot be defeated, we can face her at the top of Tartarus on January 31st. After New Year's rolls around, we can start the sixth and final block of Tartarus on the 1st of January, so we're gonna get it out of the way as soon as possible. The first three Guardians are three Noble Seekers. They are neutral to physical attacks and resist all elemental, so I put everyone on conserve SP till Fuka tells them to use physical attacks only. I use Ma Rakunda first turn, though the AI will only target one enemy for whatever reason. Whoever they target, I put Kor and Aegis on assigned target and Ken on heal and duty. Makoto's job is to heal with Meteorama, and if Ken has no one to heal, he'll go for a normal pierce attack. Now, these guys will attack with any elemental attack, and thankfully I managed to get Aegis a piece of armor that gets rid of her electric weakness. The worst that can happen is if anyone gets hit twice, especially Makoto who has the lowest endurance. Sadly, we did lose our first attempt since it is possible for them to go for a multi-hit attack, and with the persona I was using being weak to wind, it knocked Makoto down, forcing him to skip his turn, and being unable to heal before he gets killed. So the second attempt, I went with a persona that has Meteorama and no weaknesses to any elements, and there's still a lot of luck here, as Ken does get killed three times during the fight. But the less Noble Seekers there are, the easier the fight gets. Once we were down to one, I could use Makoto with my Pierce attack and persona to debuff attack and defense, and raise everyone's defense, as now I can rely on Ken for healing. And thank god because I was running low on SP. Thankfully, there was no multi-elemental attacks at all, so I was able to use Vile Assault on the last Noble Seeker to get a lot of damage in. One Vile Assault left, and we can move on. Next is three carnal snakes, and these guys are problematic and beyond annoying. They attack with Pierce, Fire, and Madoon, and while Koromaru is perfect for this fight, they also come with Fire Break, completely getting rid of Kor's nullification to fire. Physical is really the only way to go about this fight, so it's a matter of RNG whether or not we get insta-killed or killed with enough damage taken. Thankfully, Succubus has resist fire and null dark. And she is terrible for this fight. And no, we cannot use Dreamfest again as every Guardian after the Royal Dancers are immune to charm. So after two failed attempts, I've used Oze at level 44 with a maxed out Fool social link, so this should be my best persona. But just like the Hell Knights, this fight was brutal. Heck, this was probably far more hellish than the Hell Knights. So much so that I had to upload this as a video as well. So if you want to see the full fight, the link will be in the description below because I can't go into words how I went about this fight. These snakes are brutal, far more merciless than merciless difficulty in Persona 5, and completely unfair. Thankfully, they never go for Fire Break on a Persona that resists fire, so only Core will begin the effects of Fire Break. I mainly use Ken to heal, I guess to do Fall Assault, and I put Koru on Conserve SP as he sometimes goes for Augie Dine, which does practically no damage. 
there's no way to describe this fight, other than it's required to have a shit ton of luck, a lot of magic, an attack mirror so I can keep my party alive, and a few somas had to be used on this fight because they also drained more than half of my SP away. And to make these snakes even more annoying, they also come with Tetracarb because why not? Thankfully, there is a way around this. I guess we'll skip our turn if Tetracarn is active. However, by using the Rush command, we can force her to attack the enemy, and with her nullifying peers, she takes no damage getting rid of the shield. Late into the fight, they can use Mama Dune and Life Drain because life is pain. And while I can use Ma Rakukaja on Oze, the snakes do use Dikaja to get rid of the defense. However, this worked to my advantage. When there are two snakes left, I use Ma Rakukaja to get one snake to use Dikaja, while the other either attacks or uses Fire Break on Koromaru. Once there's only one snake left, I keep spamming Ma Rakukaja so the snake does nothing but use Dikaja. I have my allies wail in on the snake while Makoto and the snake play a game of support skills. This fight took about half an hour and four attempts, but my god was it far more brutal than the Hell Knights. Next is the World Balance. It's neutral to all elemental and resists all physical. And the World Balance has all elemental, all insta-kills, and almighty. So this was a matter of both luck and endurance. Though, in a mandatory battles only run, it requires a lot of patience. Unfortunately, fighting just one enemy doesn't automatically make this easier than the Carnal Snakes. The first battle was lost simply because I was going in with no solid plan. The second fight was a loss because even at full HP, one Megi Dolon is enough to kill Makoto. So, I fused the highest endurance persona I could get with Meteorama. Though, because I'm weak to fire, I equip an armor piece that I got from Block 6 with a Resist Fire perk. A slight bit less defense, but it's better than skipping our turn while we're knocked down. The third attempt actually went really well. I have all of my allies on full assault, including Ken who can only heal one party member at a time. So I buff everyone's attack first turn, then I used nothing but Meteorama while all of my allies attack. Korra and Ken will go for Elemental, and I guess will go for Pierce attack. The only annoying thing is that the World Balance has such a high agility stat. There was lots of attacks being dodged. Now the big worry for this fight is Makoto's SP running out, but thankfully once we get to the halfway point, this is when the World Balance starts to go with insta-kill attacks, which can sometimes give me a chance to restore SP onto Makoto, depending on who or if anyone gets killed. When Megi Dolan does happen, it barely kills everyone, but this does lead to one major problem. If it uses one Megi Dolan, Meteorama is not enough to fully restore Makoto's HP, and if the next attack is a Megi Dolan, well, yeah. Our third attempt was lost due to an outdated healing skill, and the best healing skill that we have access to at our low level. The fourth attempt I lost simply because I forgot to equip the armor that resists fire, the fifth attempt, I used a cup card to up my persona's endurance and stupidly saved right after. At first, this seems like it was going to go well, till it used Megi Dolan. Two turns in a row. Yeah, I just wasted an extra four endurance I could have saved up for the final boss fight. So, I'm at a loss here. Do I just keep fusing until I get a high endurance persona with Meteorama and Divine Grace, or do I just grind for some items that could help? Sadly, I only have one bead chain to work with, and according to the wiki, none of the common or rare chests on Block 6 have a bead chain. So, I have to make do with beads and hope that Ken does some good healing, but oh my god, every single time I come up with a good strategy, the world balance somehow, some way, or another knows how to kill us. Six attempt, I use beads to heal Makoto while having some of my party members die in the hope that we can get through this fight with a couple still alive or with Makoto only. However, we run into a problem. I kept using beads with Makoto and no matter what, the world balance would only use Megi Dolon. Yeah, there is no other way around this other than to die. So I lost the 6th attempt. 
The seventh attempt was our closest attempt as I give Igis the Omega Drive in the hopes that she does some critical damage, and it only worked a couple of times. Our low stats still get in the way, but it can be useful for a knockdown tactic. Near the end, I came so close, so fucking close. And here, I use Black Frost with a magic stat of 99 and use Buffalo. Oh, I really wanted to quit the run after that, but I am so close to the end, and I know it would be possible if I used up the cards that I've been saving up, so I had to keep trying. The eighth attempt, I lose to nothing but Meggy Dolons, and then I realize something. The World Balance isn't actually choosing to attack with Meggy Dolon. In some SMT and Persona games, if you take too long fighting a boss, it's actually possible for them to spam Meggy Dolon at the end in order to end the fight quicker. Essentially, a big F you if you avoided grinding. So the real problem is our damage output, not so much the endurance. Now, Korra only attacks with Ogidine, so I equip him with the Ogni Bracers, which is essentially a fire amp. And thankfully, boost and amp do stack. And I did the same thing with Ken, giving him electric amp. So I go in and see how this works. And yeah, the damage you'll see is definitely noticeable. I even managed to get one Rakuta in during the second half of the fight. Although my theory of the battle taking so long equals Megi Dolan didn't seem to be the case. It seems like the world balance actually only uses nothing but that for the remaining bit of its health. So we had to play this smart, keep healed, and get the damage onto this damn thing. Sadly, I used up my last B chain, kept everyone alive, including Ken, on Fall Assault. Ken goes down, but I chose not to revive him and just went with a Salma twice in two turns. Sadly, Ikus was not getting a critical on the world balance, but Korra was doing great damage. So after using two Salmas, I took a risk against all odds of her agility. I equipped Black Frost, used a Gale Magatama, and some severe damage in, and... Ikus attacks, and Korra... <sighs> Uh, uh, we did it! Yeah, yeah, yes! Yes! <laughs> we did it! Oh my god! Oh my god! Koru, you get a lifetime supply of treats, my friend! You are a good boy! This boss fight was brutal, but we made it. Ken sadly does not gain any EXP, but that just means more for the rest of us. And I gotta say, seeing Ken dead on the ground while the Judgment Social Link levels up is somewhat hilarious to me, but who cares? I am done. Next fight. <laughs> Next is three fierce Cyclops, because facing just one enemy wasn't brutal enough. They pretty much attack with Slash and Pierce, and sadly, we're limited by what we can attack them with, and our attacks are pitiful. But that's not the worst part. The worst part is dealing with three enemies, either doing Primal Force, which is a severe Pierce attack, or Vorpal Blade, which does heavy Slash. The first attempt, I lost in three turns, and we barely did damage to the enemy. Attempt two, I used the only two Berserker seals I got on Makoto and Ken for high counter, and while it can trigger, it's heavily reliant on chance. Two hits was enough to kill Makoto. Attempt number three, I wanted to see what would happen if I used all the cup cards on one persona to get the highest endurance possible. The answer? Makoto takes more than half the damage, and died literally first turn, so not even using the cards we've been saving up can save us. So, what do we do? And the answer is, good fucking question, I have no idea. Even if we were able to grind a ton of attack mirrors from Golden Chess, our physical barrier is only useful against one enemy, and we have three of them. 
Any skills I need, like full party healing and buffs, can only be efficiently used if my other party members had them. And after looking at how the other challenge runners got through this fight, the answer is simple. They grinded to a high level to make it possible. Something we can't do. And there's no bosses before the fear Cyclops to level up. No fusion spells can help, having 99 attack mirrors means nothing, and using all cup cards on a persona is worthless. And honestly, I think this is where the run ends. I wish I was joking, but I cannot see any way to get past this fight without grinding or getting better skills on my party members, or at least have better party members to begin with. Otherwise, I will have to say the heartbreaking truth, no. You cannot be Persona 3 by doing mandatory battles only even on easy difficulty. All right, now that I stated that it's impossible, time to record some extra footage of me using an attack mirror and using Gear Makala to repel the slash attacks and... and... wait a minute. They mostly go for slash attacks? Huh, okay, so after a bit of testing, I found out that if I equip Gear Makala, I could reflect most of the damage back at them, Keyword being most, if two Primal Forces or a Mazionga is followed up with Primal Force happens, Makoto is dead. Now, I could use High Counter for a chance to repel Primal Force back, and despite it being a 50% chance, I think our luck stat also plays an effect on how likely High Counter will go off, though correct me if I'm wrong. Seeing this, I realized that this fight might actually be possible to pass. Sadly, I've never got past one enemy in any attempts I've done. So, I think I may need to use all of my cards on Gear Makala. Or at least any Endurance, Agility, Luck, and Strength cards. And if I just rush, I can use Pierce attacks on the Cyclops with the lowest health, as Pierce is the only physical attack they are neutral to. So, I need to think. How can I get past these guys? Do I have to grind for a bunch of attack mirrors and use all of my cards on Gear Makala? I'm not sure because it's a big gamble since I was intending on saving these cards for the final day I face Nyx. Well, the only way to face Nyx is to go through this fight, so this fight is my main concern. So that's what I did. I used up all of my cards minus the one cards on Gear Makala, raising the luck, agility, strength, and endurance as much as possible. Obviously, I don't save in case this doesn't work, but we go in and go with the same strategy as before. Assign the same target for all of our allies, repel as much damage as possible, and hope that high counter triggers off of Makoto or Ken, or counter strike off of Koromaru. At some point, I switch Ken to heal in so he can revive or heal allies, so that way I can keep the damage constant. Once all of our allies died, I just used the rush command to have Makoto attack the enemy with the lowest health while I repel most of their damage. If Primal Force hits, I take the turn to use a bead. Thankfully, the cards I used helped a lot. There were a couple of hits where Makoto could have been killed but managed to evade a lethal attack, and once the enemy went to last resort after I got hit with a Primal Force, I was worried at first, but Makoto came in clutch and dodged the explosion. As I was dealing with the last two Cyclops, I revived Ken so that way he can heal and revive everyone else, and everyone else was assigned to attack one enemy only. We slowly take down the second enemy before it goes for last resort, and apparently, last resort does a fixed 50% damage as Makoto doesn't die from the explosion. So now it was just dealing with one Cyclops, and once it went for last resort, everyone except for Aegis lived. And wouldn't you know it, this fight that seemed impossible at first is actually possible thanks to Gear Makala and the cards we've been saving up. So this run is still going. And now, we reach the final guardian of Tartarus, the Jotun of Grief. This guy is a problem because he drains every attack except for Pierce and Almighty. The way this fight is supposed to go is that your allies use their elemental break skills in order to get damage in on the enemy for three turns. Sadly, that's not an option for us. So I need to make sure that everyone is equipped with the best pierce weapon, and since Koro only attacks with slash and fire, I have him set on support so he can spend his turns casting Tsukukaja on us. Now, slash and pierce, we can deal with. 
the Jolton can enrage our allies, but if he does this on an ally with a pierced melee weapon, it can actually be a blessing in disguise since they will attack twice. Though be mindful as Korra on healing and support will use a disrage on any party inflicted with rage. And you don't want Korra inflicted with rage as slash attacks drain. But the biggest worry is Megi Dolon. Now, we're at a point where we can mostly endure the attack, but after five attempts at this fight, I realize there's one major problem, and I just have to show it. Oh yeah, we receive over 400 damage and be in 100 hit points below max health. One Mind Charge Megi Dolan is a guaranteed kill and we have no cup cards to save us. So, this is where the run ends, right? Well, being the guy who did all the Persona 4 Golden damage list, there is actually one way to avoid an almighty attack. By having Makoto evade it. No amount of defense will save Makoto, but a high agility stat could work. So the plan is to take a persona with Sakuda or Basakuda to decrease the Jotun's agility and get that persona's agility to the stat of 99. How do we do that? By spending the entirety of January playing Mulwackers, of course. So I return back to reality and quite honestly my favorite chapter of the whole game. Sad music is playing, but it's arguably the best music in the game. I love the atmosphere and tone here, as it's honestly better than the tone set in Persona 4 and 5 for as effective as they were. It just sucks that I'm using emulation speed ups through it as I have Makoto spend his remaining days not with social links, not with Igis, but passing time at the arcade by himself. Yeah, something about this feels incredibly wrong. But as you can see, I maxed out some of my Persona stats, including the Persona I need to dodge the Megi Dolon attacks. So, with our final day spent, we get two homunculuses from the antique shop, as it's literally the only thing you can buy from here throughout the run. We get a lifetime supply of revival beads and medical powder, and with no Tanaka to get me out of fighting Nyx, we jump into the final day where the tired status is permanently neutral. Not that being tired has ever been a problem for us anyway. So now, with better agility and strength, let's see if we can defeat the final guardian of Tartarus. Now, thanks to all our Molwakin and punching games, it's far more possible than it was getting through this fight. But that doesn't mean we're out of the woods. Even with our agility buffed, his agility debuffed, and us equipping a level 99 agility persona, Megi Dolon can still hit us. Just because we decrease our chances of getting hit does not mean we won't get hit at all. After two failed attempts on my own, I decided if I'm going to get through this fight without rage quitting the run altogether, there's only one thing I can do to maintain my sanity. I had to stream it. Now, even on stream, this took so many attempts because sometimes the Jotun of Grief will save Megi Dolon for later in the fight, but other times he'll just start off with it for no reason. So it's entirely RNG what he will go for and entirely RNG if we can dodge the attacks. Sadly, a good majority of my turns is spent on trying to keep Makoto alive and as much of my party members as I can alive. And because we're going between buffs, debuffs, healing, power charging for a strong pierce attack, and using the rush command on Korra to avoid him using disrage on any of us inflicted with rage, the entire fight is just pure luck. And sadly, the majority of attempts either end because he kept spamming Megi Dolon or we couldn't dodge that one mind charge Megi Dolon attack. After more than an hour of attempts, we got a turn where multiple of our Pierce melee users were being inflicted with rage, and this was a great opportunity to get a lot of damage in since we attack him twice. Now, the worrying factor is that anyone inflicted with rage will take a severe amount of damage if hit. But on the upside, even if they are in rage, it is possible to get criticals and have them aid in all out attacks. And, well, I just gotta show this. Is this challenge in a poss possible in SMT3? Well, yeah, uh, if you watch Niarly, he actually did a whole uh, mandatory battle only run for SMT Nocturne where he played the entire game on uh, Merciful Difficulty and he actually did prove it's possible. Wow, you're actually not using a Diz Charm. Good boy. Did, was Makoto power charged? 
Okay, Makoto might get instantly killed if we're unlucky. No, we're not unlucky. Good, good. Okay, let Koru attack here. Good. Now go. No! I mean, at least he gets up, but... Fuck, that's the worst time to fall. <gasps> Holy shit! Oh my god, if I get hit, that's it. Oh, no, guys! Yo, oh my god! Oh my god, this is it! This is- this is it! Yes! Oh my god! Please, win this, guys! Oh my god! Oh my god! Yes! Come on! You can do it! Come on, Ken, attack! Good Ken, attack! And... Yes! Oh my god! Yes! Oh, oh my god, we did it! Everyone's standing too! Oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! Rage! Rage is what saved us in this fight! And what did I tell you guys? We did not level up a single level! This took an hour and a half of streaming and nine additional attempts to finally get a successful attempt. So I had 15 failed attempts, which may not sound like a lot, but sometimes the fight can take anywhere from 5 minutes to 15 minutes, and the successful attempt took 10 minutes. This was a battle of agility, luck, good use of tactics, and a negative ailment work into our advantage. This was without a doubt the hardest boss fight, but definitely a fight I would not blame anyone for rage quitting on. But we finally did it. We have beaten all Guardians of Tartarus and maxed out the Judgment Social Link. But there is still more fights to go. Jin is up next, and the only thing to worry about is making sure that Koro doesn't attack with fire since Jin repels fire. Now, the way that Jin works is that he targets our weaknesses and mostly attacks with multi-attack and skills. Using a persona weak to electric was a bad move on my part because I couldn't get Makoto up until he was able to get a lucky dodge when he was close to dying. But then, I found the best method for this fight. I equip Black Frost, who is weak to light and has decent buffs, debuffs, along with a 99 magic stat. So for every turn, Jin only attacks with light damage. Since you're more than likely to not get its to kill than attacked with a regular attack, this is the best option as the homunculuses can save Makoto even if it knocks him down, and Ken, who's our main healer, cannot be touched. So I just stick with Black Frost throughout the whole fight. Now, Strega in general has the reputation for being the easiest boss fights in the game, and yeah, that is true here. Only now, in a mandatory battle only run, we see it become the longest fight you'll ever see against Jin and Takaya. I kid you not, Jin, who usually takes about a few turns to take down in a normal run, took about 18 minutes in total. After we defeat Jin, we level up to 46, and we can now use both Aegis and Koromaru for Ma Tsukukaja. We depart with Jin, helping him discover the air of his ways, and realize that he can become a more complete individual. Or, less complete. Anyway, the fight against Takaya is a slight bit harder, but still pretty simple. The only worrying factor is when he uses Mind Charge, as he can either go for Megidola or a Heavy Elemental Attack. But thankfully, he's just too weak compared to the last Tartarus Guardians we had to face. I had to deal with Ken getting KO'd numerous times in a row during the fight, which I think he just has a vendetta against Ken or something. But after 26 minutes, I kid you not, it really did take that long, we finally defeat Takaya and level up to 48. And now, the only mandatory boss fight left in the game is Nyx herself. So before we go and fight her, let's have a final look at our party members. Junpei is at level 9. Yukari is at level 18. Akihiko is at level 24. Mitsuru is at level 25. Fuka is at level 48, so the same level as the protagonist. Aegis is at level 49. 
Ken is at level 50 and sadly did not learn Meteorama because of course, and Koru is at level 51 and barely learns High Counter. So, with the latter three party members joining us in the fight against Nyx, and level 48 being the minimum we can get to in a mandatory battles only run, we're gonna face death, head on, and show Nyx who the true final boss is. So, at the top of Tartarus, Nyx descends onto the tower as Nyx's avatar, and she's apparently pissed because the fanbase keeps calling her by the wrong pronouns. As tempting as it is to throw Junpei in front of her, we have to battle for everyone's souls in quite arguably the best fight in the entire game. I mean, I do love the fight against Yaldabaoth and Izanami and all, but Nyx was just better built up and it has a far more intimidating and atmospheric battle, and the music only makes it better. Nyx has 14 different phases, with each representing the Arcana leading up to the 13th Arcana, Death. Now, in a usual run, you could finish most of these Arcanas in one or three turns. When you're underleveled, however, whoo boy. I decided to stream this as I could barely record more than an hour because the memory on my computer gets full pretty quick, and here's what we discovered. So the first phase, which is technically the full Arcana, Nyx does absolutely nothing. So at this point, just put everyone on full assault. And I clearly should have had the wiki open next to me because on the next phase, she changes to the Magician and she attacks with her almighty attack, which does the most amount of damage, followed up with Maraki dying. Yeah, we died on her first turn of the Magician Arcana. Now, the important thing to keep in mind is that Nyx will have two turns per turn, so using debuffs on her will last only one turn and half on the next. And since we can't extend buffs or debuffs like we could in Persona 4 and 5, there's always going to be one turn where Nyx will have her stats reverted back to normal before we can debuff her again, and same thing vice versa with buffing ourselves. Now, the Magician Arcana specializes in fire attacks, both singular and multi-hit. Now, you're probably thinking that the best method is to use a Nullfire Persona, right? Well, that's a bad idea, because Nyx also comes with Fire Break, and while it's useful to waste that one turn with her using that skill, you're better off with a Persona that resists fire as opposed to nulls it as the enemies never use elemental breaks on a Persona that resists the attack. And when it comes to the Magician, it's pretty much an endurance battle, with us taking our health down at a snail's pace and with the need to apply buffs, heal, and Ken only being able to heal one party member per turn, you can kind of see part of the issue here. I used up so many beads, and I came into the fight with only 10. The Magician phase took 10 minutes. After that, we go to the Priestess, where it's pretty much the same as the Magician, but now she specializes in ice attacks instead of fire. And yes, that includes Ice Break 2. Thankfully, one of the Personas I fused has Meteorama and Divine Grace to guarantee a full party heal during Makoto's turn, but we also gotta keep an eye on our SP. We got through the Priestess in 9 minutes. The Empress is the same as the first two, but this time specializing in Wind. After 10 minutes with the Empress, we go to the Emperor, which is the same as the first three, but specializes in Electric. After 11 minutes with the Emperor, she switches to the Hierophant, and here is where it only gets harder. The Hierophant specializes in her using Slash and Pierce, along with Rebellion and Revolution to boost the chances of critical damage. Bear in mind, even if we crit Nyx, it's impossible to put her in a knockdown state or get a one more out of it, so the most that we get out of critical damage is just extra damage. Now, it took us an estimate of 10 minutes to get past the first four Arcanas. The chances of us being dead or knocked down after Nyx's uses two turns is very likely to happen. And after eight minutes into the Hierophant Arcana, our party was dropping like flies, and this was the lowest I got her health before she uses two almighty attacks in a row. 
with us having to worry about healing, buffing, as well as attacking, I really don't see myself being able to beat the Hierophant Arcana. And the worst part is that during the Chariot and Strength phases, instead of buffing the critical chances, she uses Power Charge to guarantee an insta-kill. And guys, I'm not gonna lie to you, this attempt where I got 8 minutes into the Hierophant took 51 minutes in total. 51 minutes, and we're not even halfway through the Arcana shifts. I don't know about you guys, but I like my sanity and prefer not to lose a whole hour of progress again trying to make this fight possible. Now, if each Arcana took us about 10 minutes roughly, we would be here for anywhere between 2 to 2.5 two hours, and once she switches to the Death Arcana, this is where the fight becomes super long. All phases has her health at 1,500 HP, and all of her stats remain the same. But during the Death Arcana, her strength and magic increases by 5 points, while the agility, endurance, and luck increases by 10 points, and she has a total health of 6,000. Now, if any of you know how the Death Arcana fight goes, you'll know that her signature move, Moonless Gown, will be a detriment in making progress. And the worst part is that Nyx resists all attacks in the game. And correct me if I'm wrong, but not even using elemental breaks helps speed up the progress. And seeing how resist damage can do like a single digit of damage with us being low leveled, guys, I could spend three hours just getting up to the Death Arcana, and maybe an extra ten hours just to get through the Death Arcana due to us being severely underleveled. And if Nyx uses Almighty Attacks twice in two turns, it's practically game over, because that move can cause critical damage too. So what does this mean? This means I am daring to release a video while refusing to defeat Nyx. That's right, I'm not going to do another attempt at this boss fight that could take half a day to complete while I have a high chance of losing every single turn. I think we would already be in contact with aliens and living on Mars by the time I make this possible, assuming I'm still even alive by then. Call me a chicken all you want, but imagine yourself fighting Nyx for 12 hours and failing every single time. So even if Nyx could theoretically be possible, I doubt this is something that even a masochist would attempt to do. Now, of course, there are a few options to consider, but they all violate the rules. Number one, I could hack a total of 99 items that I know I can grind from chests, such as beads, attack mirrors, and magic mirrors, but I highly doubt that this would make much of a difference other than get us further into the fight. Obviously, I would never grind for that long to get so many attack and magic mirrors, and while hacking them in might be justified if I prove that they are obtainable, we also need to consider that Nyx has two turns per turn, and only Makoto can use items, and if having both a physical and magical barrier forces Nyx to go with almighty attacks only, then our plan would have been for nothing anyway. Number 2. I could use the 10 plumes of dust which I managed to resist using all throughout the run. The obvious problem here is that there's only 10 of them, and this is not an automatic win if we're only doing like a single digit of damage during the death arcana. Number 3, maybe if we were to do the run all over again, we could try to find attempts to give all the experience points to Makoto only by having our allies die in combat before we defeat the bosses, or do some of them Makoto only until we can get the last three party members we intend to use for the rest of the run. But the sad reality here is that while we might be a higher level than 48, later levels do require more experience points to level up, so it's not like we double our chances of surviving attacks. This could, of course, give ourselves better personas and better skills to work with, but we still gotta consider how long the next fight will take, and the resources we need to save up as Makoto will be running out of SP if he's doing everything himself. Number 4. While we may not be able to beat the game with a minimum amount of battles, maybe we could utilize the use of mandatory battles only by carrying our progress over to a new Game Plus file. What I mean by that is that we only do battles that are considered mandatory, get either the bad ending where we kill Ryoji, or use the Nick skip glitch by starting the Devil Social Link on the 31st of January, and we can not only carry over our registered personas from the Persona Compendium, but also Makoto's level as well, as it never reverts back to level 1. 
The obvious problem with this is that it defeats the whole purpose of a mandatory battle run to begin with. And if we have to do the bare minimum to make it possible, then all Tartarus Guardians would technically be illegal from a fresh file, as we can only do the full Moon Shadows. On top of that, grinding for money in the first three floors of Tartarus would be freaking hell, and defeats the whole purpose of why people hate grinding to begin with. It makes all the complaints that people have with Tartarus look like a 10 out of 10 masterpiece in comparison. Now, there is apparently a glitch where you can frame step your way past the Tartarus Guardians, but I've tried this myself and couldn't pull it off. Now, the obvious answer to defeat Nyx is to grind to a high enough level where you can give more damage and take less damage while having higher level personas, but obviously, that just destroys the whole point of the challenge run. So in the end, Yes, you could defeat every required boss fight before you reach the Nyx fight without doing any optional battles and without using the Plumes of Dusk or a New Game Plus file. And honestly, considering how brutal most of the last Tartarus Guardians were, I think I can be happy that I got through almost all of the game while avoiding optional battles. And while there are some frustrating battles that relied on good RNG, I think this challenge run could be of good use to some runners who intend to beat the game while doing the least amount of grinding. With proper use of personas, armor, and the knockdown exploit, you can get further into the game than the developers probably originally intended. Bear in mind, some of these tricks like the knockdown strategy will not work in the portable version of the game, and you might have a better advantage in some fights thanks to the inclusion of direct commands in that version of the game. So in the end, it is not worth it to beat Persona 3 Fest with only mandatory battles. But considering that the probable moment is literally the final boss fight, I don't see that as a complete failure. I personally don't recommend this run in its entirety, but I do recommend trying out some of the tricks I use to make these fights possible while you're still underleveled. In the end, I still recommend grinding till your party gets tired and pushing them to the next level before they ditch you and head home. While it may be tedious and may not be everyone's cup of tea, it will make your experience far more better than just avoiding shadows and finding money from chests which is just as bad, if not worse. I mean, if you're gonna grind for hours for chess, you might as well grind for experience points as well. And there's even requests from Elizabeth that could reward you for grinding in optional battles, all of which I had to avoid in this run and wish I could have completed. And also bear in mind, if you're grinding solo, you will actually be gaining a lot more experience points than if you were to do it with a full party. Persona 3 Fest is a game that I remember loving for its story and characters, and having a far more impactful third act than any other Persona game I've played. The story still holds up to this day, and while I never got to the ending in this run, the ending is definitely one of the most memorable moments that still sticks to me to this day. Persona 3 definitely has the best story out of the three Persona games, and while I consider the later games to have better gameplay, I will admit, this run made me realize how useful the tactics menu can be, considering that the entire game is built around this mechanic. While I still heavily prefer direct commands, this run helped me push beyond just using Act Freely and healing. The tactics in this game do work far better than a lot of us give this game credit for when you actually know how to use them. And after doing this run, I only wish that I could fight optional shadows so that way I could grind for that extra EXP that I need. So there you go, this challenge run helped me appreciate the gameplay of Persona 3 far more than I did in my original playthrough. It's still flawed and Portable arguably has the better gameplay, but it still works. And if it's still not your cup of tea, bear in mind, we have a remake coming very soon, and I look forward to playing Persona 3 Reload when that eventually comes out. So, thank you guys so much for watching another Persona challenge run. I'm gonna try to cover other games outside of Persona, as I do want to branch out my content. If you guys want to contribute to supporting It's a Gamer, consider becoming a Patreon supporter or channel member. And a huge shout out to my channel members and Patreon supporters including Supersonic1014, Darkwing Spartan, and Deadshot. And be sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe, and ding the bell for more Nitsa Gamer content. And remember folks, the bare minimum may work, but putting in hard work will increase your chances of success.